I would, I would like to welcome you all here today. My name is Tabitha Perkins and I work in the private banking group for Zions Bank. It is my privilege to help organize client seminars like this one today. We are moving to more frequent digital seminars and we hope you will continue to join us. I will turn the time over to Scott Anderson for opening remarks. Well, thank you, Tabby. And I want to welcome everyone to this presentation today. This is our second annual economic and market overview presented by Zions Bank. And as Tabby said, I'm Scott Anderson, the president and CEO of Zions Bank. And we are excited to once again host this event to provide insight into the economic and market conditions we face today. We will discuss during this uh, day's event the, uh, what's happened in 2020, and we look forward to what to expect in 2021. This past year has been historic in a number of ways. Economic and market conditions at the beginning of 2020 were strong, with strong employment gains, low unemployment, and historic highs for the equity markets. However, the coronavirus pandemic and the resulting national quarantines and shutdowns dramatically impacted markets throughout the world. The US economy, as we all know, slipped into its most severe recession in generations with GDP contracting by historic amounts in the second quarter and more than 22 million people losing jobs. The good news is that the economy and markets are improving again. In fact, the S&P 500 ended 2020 up more than 16%. The historic fast development and deployment of a vaccine is also boosting confidence that society will be able to return to normal soon. However, we're not through the woods yet. Unemployment remains high and short-term economic conditions remain tenuous. Ultimately, the health of markets and the economy will be driven by COVID-19. Increased hospitalizations will strain essential resources and will force more economic restrictions in the short term. But we are confident the US economy is resilient and will emerge from this episode stronger. I'm really pleased today that we have both Rich and Robert with us. I will let Tabby introduce them more formally, but uh, Robert, will, who is our chief economist, will give an overview of the economy. And then Rich, the portfolio management a manager for Zion's Wealth and Fiduciary Services, will review how the markets are looking today. But welcome, we appreciate your business. We appreciate your support. We hope that 2021 will be a great year for you. And thanks for joining us. And Tabby, I'll turn the time back to you. Thank you, Scott. Our first presenter is Robert Spenlove. Many of you know him. He is an economic and public policy officer at Zions Bank. He monitors and reports on economic indicators and public policy developments. He is known for his insightful and understandable approach to explaining economics. Secondly, today we will hear from Rich Mebius. He is a portfolio manager for Zions Wealth Management. Rich has over 15 years of experience in the financial services industry. He works with high net worth clients, institutions, nonprofit organizations, and other entities implementing investment strategies to meet the client's goals and manage risk. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session if you move your cursor on the screen right now, you'll notice at the bottom, there is a box for Q&A. Um, feel free to submit questions as the presentation is going. We will address them at the end, time permitting. I will now turn the time over to Robert. Thanks, Tabby. It's great to be with you. And thanks so much, Scott, for uh, your uh, welcome remarks. Uh, I'm just gonna bring up my presentation real quick. Uh, Tabby, can you see that? Yes, it looks great. Okay, great. Uh, just like Scott said, uh, the, the last year has been truly historic. Uh, the economic conditions that we've experienced are unlike any uh, that we've ever seen before. If you kind of think about uh, what happened over the last year, 
uh, it, it really is uh, like a, what I would call a black swan event. And if you think about a black swan event, what is that? Uh, it's a, an event that's characterized by being extremely rare, uh, unexpected, uh, and having a severe impact. And then also one of the critical components of a black swan event is they cannot be prevented or predicted. And that's really what happened with the, uh, with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. No one saw it coming. No one was able to anticipate it. Uh, and it, it, the, the impact was uh, very fast and extremely uh, severe. And you'll see that uh, throughout the presentation that, that the impacts that we've seen in the last year are, are uh, very remarkable. But, uh, and something I wanna stress is kind of as we go through, the, the recession that we felt uh, last year and the, the economic conditions that we continue to see are not the result of an underlying weakness in the economy. It wasn't the result of policy mistakes. It wasn't the result of, of, uh, of inefficient markets. It was the result of this black swan event. Uh, so looking at uh, one of the ways that we look at this is a uh, monthly jobs report. So this, all, uh, this comes out from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or excuse me, the Bureau of Labor Statistics on a monthly basis, the first Friday of every month. And this is uh, looking at the monthly change in jobs uh, for the past uh, uh, about 15 years. If you look over here at the top left, you can see the impact of the Great Recession, where between February of 08 and February of 2010, we lost nearly 9 million jobs. And that was a huge impact. It, it, uh, there were some months that we were losing over 700,000 jobs a month, and it took several years to recover from this period. Now jump over to the right side. In the period of two months, March and April of 2020, we lost over 22 million jobs. In fact, in April alone, we lost 20 million jobs. So we lost 9 million jobs during the entire Great Recession and 22 million jobs in two months. Now, since then, the economy has been coming back. Jobs have been returning. Uh, and uh, over the last few months, about 12 million jobs have come back. But even though we've brought 12 million jobs back, there is still 10 million jobs uh, that remain lost that have not been brought back. 10 million people that still have not been able to find uh, the jobs that they had before the pandemic. And so that's producing a strain on the, on the US economy. When we look at the industries, so this is comparing essentially before the pandemic, before the, the recession uh, to our most recent data. And every industry has been impacted, but the industries that have seen the really big impacts, leisure and hospitality, uh, and this is essentially the energy sector. Uh, and this is, like I said, this is what's, happen what's happening right now. So even today, even with the recovery, leisure and hospitality is still 20% below where it was before the, the pandemic. And the energy industry is uh, about uh, over 10% below. And I'm gonna get into that just a little bit more in just a minute. However, we're starting to see some changes. Uh, the, the pandemic is causing people to, to change their buying patterns, change their consumer habits. And you see this in some of the subsectors. So these are the subsectors of the industries that uh, were on the last slide. And none of these are a surprise, but it's interesting to see. Couriers and messengers up 21.5%. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're all used to getting our Amazon packages and our uh, DoorDash. Um, and that, that really is a, a dramatic increase. Computers and electronics, I mean, what we're doing right now uh, requires, has required us to, to boost up our uh, computer products. Building materials, as everyone's working on their house now, uh, we're seeing a big increase there. And warehouse clubs, as everyone's kind of going to, uh, uh, to Sam's Club and Costco to, to get their things into grocery stores. So we're seeing that shift very dramatically as the, uh, as the economy changes and as consumers change. The unemployment rate is another uh, one of the, and again, you're gonna just see these gigantic impacts. Uh, so going back uh, to the great recession, 
during the, at the end of the Great Recession, our unemployment topped out at 10%. And remember how difficult that was and how during the recovery uh, it was referred to as a, a jobless recovery. Well, it, did, it took time, but we did see that unemployment rate drop. Going into uh, 2020, the unemployment rate had dropped all the way down to 3.5%, extremely low unemployment. Uh, in fact, our biggest struggle a year ago was a labor shortage uh, and trying to find uh, uh, workers. And then the pandemic hit and the recession hit, jumped all the way up to 14.7%. That's the highest unemployment that our nation has seen since the Great Depression. Uh, and, uh, and the strain was enormous. Now it's been coming down, but even now uh, it's still at about 6.7%, which is much better than it was a year uh, or uh, in April, but uh, still much higher than it was pre-pandemic. So we continue to see elevated levels of, of unemployment. <clears throat> a little bit broader measure is what we call the labor force participation rate. And this is looking at uh, everyone who has a job or is looking for a job uh, relative to the uh, working age population of the country. And so it's kind of a measure of how engaged uh, people are in, in, in the labor force. And you can see that uh, we hit our high point in 2000 at about 67% uh, labor force participation. And we've been slowly kind of dropping off. A lot of this dynamic is due to the aging of the baby boomers. But as the economy started to really gain traction in uh, 2015 and, and into tw 2020, we saw that labor force participation coming back up again, but then it just got hammered by the, by the recession dropped down to a level that we haven't seen since 1972. And even with the recovery, even with the expansion, we're still at, uh, at a level that we haven't seen since the mid 1970s. So we haven't seen that labor force participation come back to where it was even uh, pre-pandemic. The broadest measure is what we call the employment to population ratio. This includes, uh, this ratio includes not only people that are uh, engaged in the workforce, but people that are unemployed that are not looking for a job. So people that have kind of given up on the labor force. And you see how dramatic this number dropped, going from 60, uh, around 65% in 2000 uh, to <clears throat> just around 61% uh, leading into uh, the pandemic, dropped all the way down to 51.3%. We've never seen the employment to population ratio drop that low before. And again, it's coming back, but we're still much lower than we were pre-pandemic, and we still have some, uh, some room to grow to come back from that. So one of the things, one of the, the areas that, that I've been really focusing on is what we call high-frequency economic data. So most of the data that I've shown you and that I will show you in this presentation are monthly or quarterly or sometimes even annual data. Uh, this is the, the kind of the most uh, current data that we have. This is weekly data. So wh when someone uh, loses their job, if they're laid off or fired, they go to uh, file an unemployment insurance claim. And when they file that initial claim, it shows up as one of uh, in, the, in the green line. Now, after a week, if they continue to be unemployed, then they file a continued claim or they continue to file a claim, and that's the blue line. And so you can see the dramatic impact going into uh, the pandemic. About 282,000 people per week were filing initial claims for unemployment insurance. Uh, now, going uh, as the as the pandemic hit and the rec the recession really took hold, that jumped all the way up to seven million. Now it's dropped down. You can see that we've recovered, but even now, this is as of last week, 787,000 new people have filed for unemployment insurance claims. That means there, there are an additional 787,000 people that have lost their jobs last week uh, compared to the week before. And that's still almost three times as high as pre-pandemic. So we're still uh, having some struggles getting the economy back and getting people uh, reemployed. And then when you look at the continued claims, topped off at 25 million at, at, at the beginning of April, and that's come down, but there's still 5 million people uh, that are receiving unemployment insurance claims. So this is one of the reasons why it was so important, so essential 
for the for Congress and the federal government to pass uh, the, the the revised CARES Act with uh, uh, with renewed unemployment insurance uh, uh, payments. Uh, there there remains a lot of people that continue to be unemployed, and it's essential that we provide that support for those people again for this black swan event that no uh, that this didn't happen because of any errors or because of uh, underlying problems. It was because of the catastrophic nature of the pandemic. When we look at the long-term unemployment, this is uh, unemployment that's defined as six months or more. And the reason we care about this is the longer someone is unemployed, the more difficult it becomes for them to reconnect with the labor force. And so if, if we have this persistent long-term unemployment, it can really drag down the overall economy. You can see that in the Great Recession, it topped off around 7 million. Now we're not there yet, but remember, we're only nine months into the pandemic. So uh, uh, that long-term unemployment being defined as six months or more of unemployment, we're, this is really just three months of data. And we're seeing this number spike. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few months we surpassed that level from the Great Recession. And we're already higher uh, today than we were uh, at the peak of the last three recessions before the, the Great Recession. So that's something I'm gonna be watching really closely. Uh, we, we need to do what we can to try to keep this long-term unemployment as low as we can. Another one of the really strange uh, uh, changes that we saw because of, the, because of the recession was wage growth. So if you look, the green line represents our long-term average of about two and a half percent. Uh, before the recession, uh, sorry, before the Great Recession, uh, we, uh, we saw wage growth right around uh, three and a half, four percent. And again, going into the most current recession, we saw uh, kind of similar levels of around four percent wage growth. Then the the pandemic and the recession hit, and look at this: wage growth spiked all the way up to nearly eight percent. And you're probably saying to yourself, "Well, how in the world, when you're in a recession?" and 22 million people lose their jobs, can wage growth go up so dramatically? <clears throat> and this is because of the nature of who lost their jobs. Overwhelmingly, the people that lost their jobs in the spring were lower wage workers, hourly workers, uh, uh, you know, pe people, blue, people that work in blue, blue collar jobs. And so the, the effect of pulling all those lower wage workers out of the labor force actually had the effect of pushing up uh, the, 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 the wage growth calculation. It, there wasn't actually broad, broad spread, broad spread, widespread wage growth, but it skewed the data so dramatically that only those that had uh, higher paying uh, jobs were able to keep their employment and remain on the job. So as those lower wage worker, workers are being able to return back into the labor force, we see that wage growth actually returning back to normal. But again, still much higher and as an indication that those uh, lower wage workers are still struggling to get back in the workforce. The broadest measure of our economy is gross domestic product. So this is what we're looking at here. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I went back as far as we could on GDP in this data set. So this goes back to 1948. Before this year, the biggest quarterly drop that we'd ever seen in GDP was in the late 1950s when it dropped 10% uh, until this year, where in the second quarter, it dropped 31.4%. We've never seen that kind of dramatic drop in the overall economy. Uh, now, as quick as it dropped, look how quickly it recovered. This is another one of the very unique dynamics of the, uh, of the coronavirus uh, recession, was it was very swift, but it also was uh, uh, very swift in coming, but we also came out of the, uh, the recession very quickly. And in the third quarter, GDP grew by 33.1%. Uh, uh, the, again, the largest growth that our uh, country has ever seen. But you may look at this and say, well, okay, so we've got, we went down 31%, but then we went up 33%, so we're out of the, out of the hole. Let's see, the, the problem with that is when you look at the actual amount uh, of the, or the value of gross domestic product, you see that we're not quite there yet. In the fourth quarter of last year, of, uh, excuse me, of 2029, 
We are at 19.3 trillion. Even with the recovery, we're still only at $18.6 trillion in the value of, G of GDP. So we're about three and a half percent below, or about $700 billion below the level that we were experiencing a year ago. And even though it's only three and a half percent below, it would require 15% growth in GDP in the fourth quarter to surpass that previous level. And uh, uh, I don't think that we're going to, when, when we get the data for the fourth quarter, uh, I don't think we're gonna see 15% growth in, uh, in GDP. So we're, we still remain lower and the e economy is smaller than it was uh, a year ago. Consumer confidence has been a big part of that. Uh, again, uh, we've seen, and uh, you see these kind of big impacts from uh, the pandemic. So, I, but I wanna back out a little bit. So this green line uh, indicates where people feel like the economy is strong and prosperous. And we saw a big jump a, a, in 2016 and 2017 where consumers felt really good and it stayed at a very high level around 130 for several years. But then we saw the hit of the pandemic and the shutdown uh, and we're kind of at a new level where consumers don't have the same confidence that they had before. And when you have lower uh, consumer confidence, you have lower consumer spending and consumer spending is about two thirds of GDP. So about two thirds of the economy. So that's kind of what's holding back that economic growth. Another way to see that is our personal savings rate. Uh, again, the, the highest we've ever seen is in the 1970s, we saw a personal savings rate of about 17% until the pandemic. We saw it spike up to 33.7%. Now, the reason for that is kind of a combination of a few things. One of them is that uh, support from the federal government through the CARES Act. Remember, the CARES Act was uh, over three, well, the CARES Act and other federal support was over $3 trillion of federal spending. You know, whether it was the the, uh, uh, the PPP program or the, or the checks to individuals or the unemployment uh, uh, benefits. But, and people spent a lot of that money, but they also held on to a lot of it. And so we saw that personal savings rate jump up because of that constrained consumer confidence. Now, again, it's come down, but it's still at a much, much higher level than it was pre-pandemic. Looking at the energy market, I mentioned the weakness in energy prices and uh, a little bit of context. So this is looking at the price of oil in green and oil production in blue uh, measured by US oil rigs. And you can see the big drop. Uh, this was a supply driven drop when uh, Saudi Arabia flooded the world market with cheap oil. It drove that production from around 1600 oil rigs down to about 300. But then the, over the next few years, the market recovered Oil prices were around $40 to $80 a barrel, and that extraction recovered up to around uh, $900. But look, it never got back to that pre-2015 uh, that, that pre level. The exact opposite thing happened this year, where we saw a demand-driven collapse in oil markets, where there were actually a few days where oil prices went negative. In other words, oil producers had to pay people to take the oil off their hands. Uh, now, it's come back, the prices have come back up and we're around $40 a barrel again, but look at that extraction. We're now only at about 160. So we went from 1600 in 2014 to today we're at 160. I don't see that, uh, that uh, extraction activity going up dramatically in the, uh, in the near future. The Federal Reserve, in addition to Congress, the Fed has been very aggressive in addressing uh, this uh, the, this economic situation. They dropped uh, the federal funds rate all the way down to zero, and they've essentially committed that they're going to keep it there uh, as long as it takes to give the economy the boost it needs. One of the concerns of that, though, uh, and one of the criticisms of, of all this federal spending has been that we'll see uh, very high inflation. Uh, but at least up until now, we haven't seen signs of that. The Fed's target is around 2% inflation. You can see pre-Great uh, Recession, we had uh, uh, inflation above 5%, but our biggest struggle lately, and you can see uh, during the Great Recession, we had uh, disinflation or deflation. During the oil collapse, we had deflation, and we almost saw that earlier this year. Even now, even with all the federal spending, our inflation is still below the Fed's target of 2%. 
However, one of the longer term concerns that we need to uh, be thinking about is uh, the national debt. Uh, with all this spending, uh, national debt uh, as a share of GDP is approaching the levels that we haven't seen since World War II. It's the, uh, the highest level that, that we've seen uh, really in, uh, in decades. And if you look at this line right here, it shows the impact of that increased federal spending on the national debt. Uh, like I said, right now we're in the middle of, a, of the pandemic. We can't be overly focused on the debt, but we've, we've got to be, uh, as soon as we uh, are, are through this uh, situation, through the emergency, we've got to focus on uh, addressing and reducing the national debt. Looking at how the economy will recover, looking into 2021, you can kind of see these are looking at different recessions over the years and kind of the shape of those recessions. Here's a U-shaped recession. Uh, here's a V-shaped recession with a, a quick recovery. You see the quick drop and we started to see a quick response uh, looking like a V, but now it's starting to taper off. So this recovery, at least up till now, is looking more like maybe a Nike swoosh uh, or a reverse square root where we have initial quick response, but then slow ultimate recovery. Looking regionally, uh, uh, luckily things are looking really good in our region. Uh, Idaho uh, is once again, the fastest growing state in the US uh, in terms of population, followed uh, closely by Arizona and then Nevada and Utah over the last year. Uh, over the last 10 years, we see a similar trend uh, where Utah actually has the, the highest growth over the last decade with over 17% growth followed uh, very closely behind by Idaho. And also several of the Western states are seeing really strong uh, uh, population growth. Looking at employment growth, uh, Idaho just became the first state in the country uh, to go back net positive on job growth. Uh, every state was impacted by the recession and every state struggled, but uh, Idaho and Utah are really leading the country in their uh, recovery. And you compare that to look at this, Nevada and California over 7%, New York still down 10%, and Hawaii down 17%. Uh, so uh, especially relative to some of the really struggling areas, uh, the Intermountain West is doing very well. When we look at the unemployment rate, this is a little bit surprising. Uh, both Utah and Idaho have, uh, are, are not the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Utah is number six, Idaho is number 12. So you would expect with such a strong economy for them to have lower unemployment kind of rivaling the, the very low states. But this is one of those interesting things where it's actually a good indicator. And the reason for that is when you look at the labor force participation rate. So the green is the US, uh, yellow is Idaho and blue is Utah. And you see while the US remains below the pre-pandemic pre labor participation, look at this, uh, Idaho, is back to where it was before, as is Utah. So what, what that means is we're pulling more people off the sidelines and into the labor market, and that can actually drive the unemployment rate up. So this is one of those weird situations where a higher unemployment rate is a sign of a strong economy. One of the struggles though is uh, home values are really skyrocketing. You can see as recently as just about uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, both Utah and Idaho had home values right around the national average. Uh, but look at this, you can really see where it started to take off in 2017 in Idaho um, and Utah. And now uh, both Utah and Idaho have housing prices that are much above the national average. When we look at the growth rates, now there's two kinds of dynamics happening. One, one of them is the impact of the Fed lowering rates to uh, uh, the federal funds rate to zero. That really dropped the mortgage rates. So that's driven home demand throughout the country. And so you can see that in the green where home price appreciation has gone up, but then look in both Utah and Idaho, it's been much more pronounced because it's a combination of the lower interest rates coupled with uh, in migration and people moving out of some of the uh, states like California and New York into Utah. And that's driving even higher housing price appreciation. So this is great if you own a home. But if you're in that low income group or just starting out your career, just coming out of college, getting your first job, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to find affordable housing options. So kind of putting it all together, 
uh, as I mentioned, and Scott mentioned that th this was something that we've never seen before. The contraction was, uh, was dramatic and swift uh, and coming out of it uh, in the short term, the economy will continue to struggle. Uh, the, especially in those areas like uh, leisure and hospitality, in travel and tourism, in entertainment, uh, in personal services, because it's being driven, the economy is being driven by the virus. And as long as we have the virus continuing to surge, uh, it will continue to struggle. Uh, the economy will continue to struggle. This is why that continued federal support and state support is essential. We can't back down now, right when we're in the toughest period. However, um, looking ahead six months, uh, uh, kind of mid-year, as the vaccine rollout starts to accelerate, as more people get immunity, uh, we'll be able to reopen those parts of the economy that are being constrained. And we should actually see a strong economic growth uh, in the latter half of 2021. And we should see uh, markets, individuals, and economies returning to normal. Uh, and then the, just kind of the last point is those regional economies, uh, especially Utah and Idaho, remain uh, really strong. Uh, they're leading the country in the recovery. Uh, and and I, I do think that not only will our regional economies continue to grow strong, but our uh, US economy will be strong as well. Uh, however, it is important to keep in mind that uh, the economy will be different a year, a year from now than it was uh, a, a year ago. We're, we're kind of in a new normal. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it will be different. Uh, but this is, to me, this is kind of the nature of a dynamic economy, and I remain optimistic about the future. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. Uh, thank you for your comments, and thanks, Scott, for your opening remarks. Uh, I pulled up a slide here. We're going to transition to the market uh, recap and outlook. Uh, Tabby, can you see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Great, thank you. So as we look at uh, the outlook, normally I put this at the end, but uh, just in, in terms of time, we wanted to make sure that we talk about what our outlook for wealth management looks like in 2021. Uh, despite some uh, corporate earnings falling in 2020 uh, from lockdown, recession, and some of the other activities, uh, unfortunate activities that were discussed earlier, uh, earnings fell. And uh, at the end, we had a market recovery, which left PE ratios pretty high. Um, so one of the, the uh, concerns that people have is the market overvalued. Uh, we do see that in 2021, that earnings should rebound and allow stocks to grow into those valuations. Um, right now, as we look at the forward PE ratio, it's about 23, which is above the long-term average. And uh, so again, we would expect to see corporate earnings increase and uh, that grow into the valuation. When we look at the S&P 500 for year end, right now our target is looking at a 3850 to about a 3900 as the target range for year end. Obviously this could change, but that's what we're looking at right now. And that would represent about a four to 6% return in the S&P. As we look toward bonds, this is going to be one of the challenging areas uh, for a lot of the reasons that Robert talked about, uh, where inflation pressure is likely to be limited and the Federal Reserve is expected to keep rates low. Uh, we could also see some economic improvement and uh, potential for higher government spending, additional stimulus, and that could put some upward pressure on uh, on rates, which would cause prices of bonds to go down. So we're looking at a 10-year uh, treasury yield in the range of 1.25 to 1.75%. Uh, when we recap uh, 2020, uh, I like to call it a year of lessons and reminders for investors. Uh, we had a lot of lessons and a lot of reminders 
uh, for us throughout the year. And as I go through the presentation, I'll touch on some of those uh, as we go forward. So, uh, you know, when we look at returns for the year, uh, most asset classes finish the year positive uh, with the exception of REITs or real estate. Um, those have some challenges uh, highly tied to that um, leisure and hospitality sector that Robert talked about. Um, but small caps led the way and ended the year over 20% returns, followed by large cap and emerging market stocks that were up over 18%. And then as you can see, um, even bonds between high quality bonds and municipal bonds also had a great year. So while it was a, an abnormal year for everything, market returns, if you look at the end of the day, were really strong. Um, but when we look forward again, some of the changes uh, are gonna be behavioral changes and it's gonna change the way that companies do business, the way that uh, us as consumers um, consume, uh, how we consume and the way we connect with each other. Uh, for example, on uh, a virtual presentation versus in person. Breaking down, uh, breaking down the sector performance, uh, when we look at technology, technology really benefited from these behavioral changes and powered the economic or powered the equity market. So technology closed the year at over 42% returns. Again, really strong. And you're seeing strong returns in some of the ways that we changed throughout the year. Uh, when we look at some of the cyclical sectors like utilities um, and financials, real estate, and even energy, uh, they had a strong rebound in November. It just wasn't strong enough to overcome the weak start in uh, the beginning of the year. Switching gears a little bit uh, for some outlook, you know, one of the questions that a lot of investors have is after a really strong recovery and rebound in the market, where, where do we go from here? Is there much room left in the rally? Uh, and if we look back to history, history would suggest that yes, there is still room to run. Uh, when we look at this chart, uh, just to explain it a little bit, uh, this is looking at periods uh, where the S&P declined by 25% or more, uh, which is in blue and tracking from the bottom of the uh, decline through uh, the end of the year. The green represents the following 12 months. So bottom line of what you're looking at is the 12 months following, uh, the market has returned on average 8% returns. So really good returns. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have negative returns. Um, we have had positive returns. The caveat to that is that it doesn't come without uh, cost, meaning uh, there's volatility. So in each of these rallies, the average correction is 9% um, in those following years. So, you know, again, another of these lessons and reminders for us as investors is the market can move higher, but we do have volatility. Um, and that's something that we should expect. One of the signals that we look at is um, looking at consumer discretionary stocks uh, compared to consumer staples. And this is an equal weight um, benchmark for each of these sectors. And you can see that the, as the line moves higher, it does indicate growth and it is a growth signal. Uh, one of the things that it is important to note is that this is an equal weight and it's taking out the impact of Amazon. Amazon is a big uh, beast and can move any index that you include it in. So it's important to note that this is equal weight and it does again show a strong growth. 
what we would need to see is that line starting to move downwards for a significant period of time to uh, flash any kind of warning signals. Another chart uh, or indicator that we look at is how attractive are stocks to bonds. And ultimately, stocks are a function of future earnings and interest rates. And so uh, certainly there are concerns about uh, economic growth. But as interest rates remain low, um, stocks are still more attractive than bonds. So when we look at the chart, if that line goes um, below, stocks become less attractive. Uh, you can see the big spike that we had in uh, in springtime early this year, where equity sold off and they became more attractive to bonds. Um, so right now we're not um, significantly overpriced from evaluation to bonds. And we would recommend um, having a slight overweight to equities to fixed income compared to your target long-term allocations. Another lesson uh, for us as investors is uh, volatility. Um, so while the sharp decline that we had this year and the uh, really strong rebound was abnormal, the lesson really remains the same. And that is that uh, we do have volatility in the market and as investors, we should expect that. So when you look at this chart, the gray bars represent calendar year returns uh, for the S&P 500. Uh, the red dots represent the um, maximum drawdown or the lowest drawdown point at, uh, in each year. Each year you can see that there have been declines and it's just a normal part of investing. Uh, however, the calendar year returns suggest that uh, the market is positive 75% of the time. And uh, so we do get those positive returns but it, you do get some pullbacks. Um, also interesting to look at uh, the pullbacks is pullbacks over 25% are rare. Um, in fact, it's only happened uh, six times in the last 40 years. So again, the bottom line is volatility is to be expected, um, but we do get uh, positive calendar year returns uh, the majority of the time. I talked earlier about uh, small cap stocks and how they uh, outperformed and was one of the leading performers for the year, um, but it didn't come without some volatility. And uh, just another lesson for us, as you look at the chart here, the gray represents small cap and the blue is large cap stocks. And uh, if you look at the lows in March, small caps were down over 40% and significantly uh, underperformed large cap. And from a, a portfolio manager and, and how you put a portfolio together, that's some of the inputs that you put in is um, that risk reward for uh, portfolios. And then fast forward, or if you look through the rest of the year, small caps underperformed. It wasn't until December that you actually saw the turning point where small caps outperformed and ended the year higher than large cap. Uh, I think also it's important to mention that uh, for our wealth management clients, we did a rebalancing in portfolios at the end of October and, and first part of November, trimmed some of our large cap allocation and added to small caps. Um, so those investors were able to benefit from some of that outperformance later in the year. Uh, another lesson is uh, just the challenging nature of market timing. And uh, really the time horizon is uh, what matters most for investors. Uh, while we would all love to miss the worst days of the market and, and only be invested in the best days, History suggests that's really difficult to do. And uh, if you look at this chart uh, that we're looking at, uh, this is uh, looking at annualized returns going back to 1995. 
in the S&P 500. And staying fully invested, you had an annualized return of uh, just over 8%. However, in that time period, if you just missed the five best days, your annualized return was about 2% lower um, over that time period. And it gets dramatically worse uh, the more days you miss. Uh, and also there are some other studies that suggest or that have shown that some of those best days are generally within two weeks of the low. Um, so it just shows that time horizon, staying invested and staying the course is really the best strategy for investors. Looking a little bit at the fixed income market, uh, one of the things that we look at is the spread between high yield bonds and five-year treasury. And uh, what, what you're seeing essentially with the line uh, being low is that you have a really tight spread between high yield and treasuries, meaning the, the bond market is not seeing any concern uh, at the moment. If you look back in early this year, that line spiked higher, which indicated that there was major concern. And this is when the um, government and the Fed stepped in with those um, stimulus and spending programs to really calm markets. And you can see that that, uh, that impact was pretty immediate as that line went down. Um, so again, going back to Robert's comment, uh, those policies uh, were extremely important to the market. Looking at a source of fuel for the market is money market assets. Uh, we're still showing historic high levels of cash uh, that are on the sidelines. And as you can see, you've had a little bit of money coming out, but still at extremely uh, high and, and record levels. Um, so this, this is gonna be fuel as investors become discouraged with low rates. This could move into bonds um, and even stocks to provide um, continued support to the market. Another signal that is widely looked at is the uh, yield curve, which is the spread um, between 10-year treasury and the two-year treasury. As that line, that slope moves higher, just meaning that investors that are investing long-term um, are getting a little bit higher yields than short term. And that's exactly what we would want to see. Um, and that line continues to move higher, suggesting an overall economic growth and uh, is a positive indicator as well. Um, but the bond market still has some challenges. Uh, when we look at the economy coming back into gear, um, additional stimulus, uh, that's going to provide a tailwind for stocks, um, but it could lead to some uh, challenges or lowered expectation for bond investors. Uh, I know as I travel throughout Utah and Idaho, uh, you know, one of the questions that comes up quite a bit is low rates and what do we do about that? Um, and, and it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, we don't see a big turnaround there and, uh, but with the backdrop of uh, a strong economy over time, it should work out. Um, so one of the questions then that investors have is then why should I own bonds, right? Uh, if, if expectations are pretty low, then uh, why should we own part of that in our portfolio? Uh, if we look at this chart here, this answers the question and again, is another reminder of why you own bonds. Uh, right now, we really believe that high quality bonds are a strong diversifier in a portfolio. And if you look at different time periods where the S&P declined by at least 10% uh, between 20, 2010 and 2020, uh, the stock market returned or gave you a negative 16% return while bonds gave you a positive 1.4%. So for investors, that's right now, that's why you own bonds is to provide that buffer. 
Um, adding some other sectors in fixed income, such as high yield and emerging market debt, can help offset some of the reduction in interest that um, clients receive. So a, a couple slides here to wrap up. Um, you know, I had mentioned earlier, we did a rebound for our uh, investment clients. And just to highlight some of those, uh, a reduction of large cap stocks, increased mid and small cap and international stocks. And then in fixed income, we did increase emerging market debt uh, for some of those reasons that I talked about. Uh, lastly, I, I wanted to show performance for our wealth management group. Uh, we spend a lot of time and, and do a lot of research and, and uh, due diligence to make sure that our clients are getting the best um, unbiased advice. And when we look at returns, uh, we, we feel really good about what our clients were able to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, really on behalf of Zions and Wealth Management, I just personally would like to thank our clients for having confidence in us and staying the course through a challenging year. Uh, so with that, uh, let me switch here. We'll uh, go to the Q&A section. And Tabby, if you wanna take that, we'll go from there. Yes, I will. Um, thank you, Rich and Robert. So far, this is great information. We have had a bunch of questions come in. I wanna approach a couple of them. As far as slides, this is really great information. We are happy to share it with you. We are working on being able to di distribute that um, if you don't receive it by tomorrow, please reach out to your banker and we'll get that to you. We also plan to share this on YouTube um, by tomorrow. So be looking for those. Um, the first question I have is for Robert. Looking at the GDP's 31.4% drop, was the drop even across all components such as spending, government, personal investments, less trade deficit, or were some components more heavily affected? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, it's actually a really interesting dynamic of what we saw in the second quarter. We actually had two of the components of GDP that grew in the second quarter. That was government spending and net exports. And uh, they, they didn't grow by a lot, but they did grow. However, uh, the vast majority of GDP, about two thirds of the economy is consumer spending and personal consumption dropped by 24%. Uh, and then you add that with, uh, with business spending. So consumer and business spending was really what dragged the economy down. And even though we had that small growth in government and net exports, uh, it wasn't able to uh, uh, counteract the impacts that we saw from consumers and, spend, uh, and businesses. Okay, great. Um, another one that several people are kind of asking, I'm condensing, what impact will the Fed actions and fiscal stimulus have on inflation and the national debt? Do we think it'll take a long time to recover from? Should we be concerned? You kind of went over some of this, but maybe to just touch base really quick. Yeah, do you want me to take that? Yeah. So, and this is one of, this is one of kind of the biggest debates going on right now is will we have a big inflation later in the year? And, you know, and the struggle is generally when you have really expansive, really stimulative monetary and fiscal policy, it tends to have a big impact on, uh, on inflation because we're flooding the market with all of these uh, uh, cheap dollars and it should uh, cause big inflation. And it's certainly possible that we will see inflation in the latter half of 2021, but at least right now, <clears throat> we're not seeing that in the aggregate. Now there, there's sectors where we are seeing inflation. We talked about that a little bit with, with housing. We're seeing a lot of housing price appreciation uh, in uh, some uh, consumer goods, we're seeing some inflation, but overall uh, we're just not seeing signs of inflation yet. And Jerome Powell, uh, is kind of on the, sorry, Jerome Powell is the chair of the Federal Reserve. And he said he's kind of on the side of allowing inflation to go a little bit higher than that 2% uh, because they want to, uh, you know, they want to have more of that inflationary growth and more of that upward pressure. Now, if it does get above that 
three or four percent, then the Fed will have to start raising interest rates again. Um, with regard to the national debt, it's really hard to know exactly when and how it will have a negative impact on the economy. It will. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm here to tell you, you know, some people like to say that the, the national economy is so complex that the debt doesn't matter. I just disagree with that. I think it does. And I think if you just relate it to your household, um, if the higher amount of debt you have, the more you have to spend on servicing that debt. And that's what our country is gonna be doing. The more that we uh, finance with debt, the more we're gonna to have to spend on servicing it. And the more difficult it will be to spend money on other important priorities. And that will, it, it, I, I'm not, I don't think you're gonna see a collapse of the economy or of the country, but you will see our potential for growth will be slowed if we don't get a, a, a good hold of that debt. Yeah. Um, I, Rich, I just, yes. Yes, uh, from a, a market standpoint, uh, some inflation isn't necessarily bad. Um, if we have rapid inflation, uh, obviously that erodes into returns and increases your purchasing uh, or decreases your purchasing power. Um, but some inflation isn't bad and that can help provide a little bit of boost as long as it's within a range. Um, from a fixed income standpoint, you know, existing uh, bondholders will see some principal erosion. Uh, that's why you may need to hold and maintain those uh, bond positions until maturity. But uh, as you're purchasing new bonds, you're going to be able to benefit from some of those higher rates. So within moderation, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. I'm fortunate that I get a question both of these guys on a regular basis. We only have a few minutes left, so hopefully we can make some of the comments short, but I think this one's important. Um, directed to Robert, how might the new presidential administration change economic prospects and tax policies? Um, also with kind of the toss up with the Senate and the House, um, what do you predict with some of that? Yeah, and I'll try to go quick with this. Um, you know, the, I, I think we all, uh, agree that we, we have more consistency than we did six months ago. We know uh, that uh, President Biden will be inaugurated in a couple of weeks. We know that the Democrats will uh, uh, control the House. Uh, there's still that question about who's gonna control the Senate though, and that the election today will determine control of the Senate. Um, now, in general, what we, what we would see with a, a Democrat controlled Senate uh, so then Democrats would control the House, the Senate, and the White House. Uh, on the short term, you would see more uh, fiscal stimulus. You would see more uh, CARES Act type funding, which would boost the, uh, the economy. But it would also grow that deficit that we we're talking about. And so that's one of the concerns that have been expressed. On the other side, uh, you would see uh, the, the, the president and members of Congress have said, that they want to reverse parts of the, uh, the 2017 tax reform and increase some taxes on different parts of the economy. So that could have a somewhat uh, depressing uh, uh, impact on economic growth. However, I think even if that were to happen, it would be, they would wait until after the economy uh, was starting to recover to have that impact. So I think with the, with the Republican control of the Senate, you would see much of the, the um, Biden agenda would be kind of suppressed but, uh, uh, from what he would like it to be. We would have lower stimulus, which would uh, be kind of a, a drag on the economy, but we would have a little more uh, regulatory light approach than would otherwise be and uh, uh, going, going a little bit further out. Great. Okay, this is gonna be our last question. This is for Rich. Um, what advice do you have, not just for an average person, but also investors with all the uncertainty right now? Yeah, there is a lot of uncertainty and, uh, you know, challenges as we go forward. Uh, probably economic recovery is still slow going. We're going to have some bumps and, and uh, bruises along the way. Uh, one of the advice, or probably the main advice that I would have for clients, again, is uh, having that time horizon and a diversified portfolio. For a long time, there was uh, questions about why should we have a diversified portfolio? Um, asset allocation doesn't work. 
And I think last year was a great reminder that, yeah, it does work and you want to have exposure and you want to have that right mix. Um, the question or the challenge, I guess, for investors is what does that mix look like? And uh, for a lot of our clients, uh, a main priority is planning. You know, we don't just come in and uh, tell a client, okay, here's the, here's the portfolio. This is going to uh, give you these returns. It's really planning is leading the way. And we have great planning resources. We have a lot of really capable people. And that's the first conversation is, what are your goals? What are the plans? What does this money need to do? And then we look at a portfolio that's the right mix um, because we want to make sure that we achieve the returns that you need with the least amount of risk. Um, and you can't do that unless you have a plan, you have that roadmap. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out and if you have some concerns, uh, let's review that and make sure that you're on track and we can plug in different scenarios about what if taxes go up? Um, what if returns look lower? You know, we can model that out and make sure that your um, long-term goals that uh, you can accomplish that. That's a great reminder. Um, in closing, I know everyone has a lot of questions about the stimulus um, that is coming out. The bank is ramping up to be prepared for that. So please be reaching out to your banker, especially if you want to follow up on some of these things that Rich and Robert have talked about. We have advisors that your bankers know um, that can help suit your needs. Um, we just want to thank Robert and Rich so much for um, presenting to us today. The work that they do is really valuable, not just for our bankers and our clients, but also our community. Um, we are going to put up there a slide that has their email. I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you for trusting us with your business and your banking needs. And we hope to have more of these presentations in the future. And we hope that you will join us again. Thank you so much. Have a great day.